Dylan was a great charmer. You know, everybody forgave him almost everything. And it was because he had part of him was very immature, like a little boy. You know, when a toddler comes in and says, no, mummy, no, I haven't eaten your, any of your biscuits and chocolates all round his mouth. Dylan was very much like that. I've always thought of him as being a naughty boy. He's just a naughty boy and he'd show off. And of course it came from the fact that he was terribly spoiled. His mother spoiled him and he never got over that. And when I hear of the, tr the things that he did in, in America, etc., etc., that's exactly, there, there was no malice. There was absolutely no malice at all. It was an innocence. I don't think anybody could speak Ill, Ill of him because he, he, it was in him to be a good person, a nice person, you know. And that voice, oh, well, you die for it, honestly. <laughs> it was rich and resounding, you know, and, uh, and as I say, very well spoken, you know, not slurred at all, even when he was drunk. Dylan had um, a sort of a slow, almost parsonic way of speaking. Now, Richard Burton had a voice similar to, to Dylan's, to compare with Dylan's voice. He had a voice something like Richard Burton's, only a bit lower. A magnificent voice. I was very privileged, you know, to be there. I, I was just aware of the fact that, he, that he, he could hold an audience so easily, you know. And you always saw, when you went into the pub, you would find a crowd in one corner and screams of laughter coming. And you knew that was where Dylan was. And I just knew as a child that when these young men came, there was going to be laughter, there was going to be fun. He was friendly, full of fun, enjoying life. And his company was always a pleasure. But my mum always had fresh flowers in the house. And he used to eat the petals of the fresh flowers. And I used to think that was wonderful fun. They were terribly naughty boys, you know. They led the, the masters uh, a pretty <laughs> difficult time. If the lesson was getting a bit that's boring and everything, he'd get up, he didn't make a fuss, he'd get up and he'd close down his desk. Now the teacher never interfered because he knew he's bored and he'd, he'd go off, you see. Uh, Dylan was skiving off one afternoon about two o'clock down a long drive from the main building. One day he was crossing the, well, the quadrangle, you know, going on to the home now, and the headmaster was there. And Dylan was coming up well and truly caught. And there was another boy with him, and the headmaster said, Where are you going? Home, sir, he said. Very beautifully mannered, see. Home, sir. Why? Well, I'm bored to death with the lesson. He's not very good, you know. And he said, right, he said, all right, then I'll see to it. Right, now, go straight home now, Dylan. And uh, Thomas, you go straight home now, he said, because you're in term time and I'm responsible for you. Yes, sir, he said. Off he went. And know what he said one day? And the headmaster said, take care, you don't get caught. <laughs> you know, like as if he was in trouble with that as the headmaster. Apparently, the first time he ever saw me, Fred must have said to him, my, my niece is upstairs, my mum must have brought him up to my bedroom and I had been ill. And he said to her, if she looks like this when she's ill, what does she look like when she's well? He was a lovely little show-off, you know. Um... I, I mean, he was so pretty, wasn't he, you know, with his curly hair and his big brown eyes, you know. Um, and you could see why w women wanted to do that to him, you know. <laughs> yes. But I think women took to Dylan very, very quickly, partly because of this little boy aspect. I think most, most women are rather moved by, you know, the little boy, the helpless boy who can't do anything. 
and he couldn't. I mean, he couldn't wash his own clothes. He couldn't find a clean pair of socks. He couldn't do anything, really. He came in about two o'clock after they'd all been out to the pubs. And he always came to the door of the library and he'd look, Miss Griffiths? Oh, yes, is it? Yes, go on. He'd go down then to the back of the museum to where the gents were. Now, in the gents, they'd put a big old-fashioned chair because they knew that he would want it and he'd settle down there and he'd sleep until six o'clock. Then I'd go down. Now, my mother never knew this. I said this on television. My mother never knew. I had to knock the door of the gents, open the door gently and say, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas, we have to close up now. And he came out. Do you know, I don't think he could be bad-tempered. He was so lovely. He was flurried, you know, and he put himself right, you know, when he came out. He said, um, right, you go and tell Have you got an assignation, Miss Griffiths? I said, oh, so he's, he's asking me if I got a date for anybody. I, I, you know, that's the common way. Yes, I said, I have, with all my guides in St Mary's, and I'm late. I do beg your pardon. Come on, I said, you know. And I personally, I mean, I went to pubs several times. I never saw him drunk. I saw him having, I saw him get very, what you might call, elevated. But he did that easily. You know, he had, unfortunately, Dan Jones, his closest friend, who'd known him since school days, said Dylan had a very soft head. He easily, easily became elevated. He came out of a pub absolutely sober and saw somebody coming up the road he knew and became immediately drunk, you know? He was showing off. And John Pritchard and I were walking past the weed sheaf one evening and the swing doors opened and Dylan came rolling out. He'd been thrown out and Cacklin came behind him and she said, if only Dylan would just once pick on a little man. But of course, she was the one who picked on the big, handsome Canadians and Australians. He was really a little boy, he was. A little boy with a, oh, what a gift. He was a friend. You know, who happened to be very talented. Theodora Fitzgibbon, who was Constantine's wife, met him once coming out of her house where he was staying with her little miniature sewing machine. And she said, Dylan, you put that back immediately. You were going to pawn it, weren't you? He said, Theodora, how could you think that? I noticed there was a bit of rust on it. I was taking it to get it polished. And anyway, he said, if I had pawned it, I'd have bought you the ticket. <laughs> he was very lovable. That's the other word, innocence. Lovable innocence is what you have to call it.